Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Joyce Coleman. I'm the executive director of the Vasculitis Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to today's first ever Vasculitis Men's Conference. We want to thank you for joining us. Our goal for today is just to begin the discussion about how vasculitis impacts men. Uh, we know we won't be able to address all the issues, thoughts, comments, suggestions today, but we at least want to start the discussion with you, our patients and family members. Joining me today as co-host co is Kaylin Larson, the Director of Development and Communications for the Vasculitis Foundation. She served as our Director of Research Affairs for the Vasculitis Patient Powered Research Network, our VPPRN, for seven years until this past May. Um, she has been instrumental in bringing the patient's voice and participation to the VF's research efforts. Also joining us today in the background is Ed Becker, our VF media producer. Ed is in charge of organizing, coordinating, and producing all of our Road, uh, road to Wellness webinars, as well as our COVID-19 series, and also our individual disease uh, webinars, which he, he launched earlier this year. In addition, Ed is producer of the Vasculitis Visionaries podcast series and also our podcast uh, series with the ACR VF guidelines with Dr. Mike Putman. So I just want to say thank you to both Kaylin and Ed for helping coordinate today's meeting. I also want to thank our sponsors, Amgen, Genentech, GSK, and Sanguine for their participation and their sponsorship of our 2021 Vasculitis Virtual Patient and Family Conferences. We really, really appreciate their support. So a few housekeeping details. Um, if you have questions, please submit them through the chat box or the question uh, field. And please note, we're not gonna be able to answer direct specific medical questions. Please keep your questions general. We will be gathering them throughout the whole morning. And if we're not able to get to them, we will collect them and then try to get them answered afterwards. So, um, if you have any questions, please just put something in the chat box. Ed and Kaylin are helping monitor that, and we will try to help you get your questions answered. So our first, our first speaker today is Jason Wadler, who just returned from vacation late, late last night, maybe early this morning. Um, Jason lives in Glencoe, Illinois. He is a managing director at Soul Partnership, which is an investment and advisory firm for entrepreneurs who are looking to not just make money, but also make a difference. Jason joined the VF Board of Directors in 2011 after his GPA diagnosis. He has served as president of the board, as well as chaired several of our awareness and marketing committees. And as a patient, he's always, always believed in raising awareness of vasculitis as a rare disease. He was also co-organizer co of the annual Chicago Land uh, Bowling Alley Tournament, which was just a fun fundraising event that he and Karen Hirsch hosted for five years. He was also one of the co-founders co and instrumental in bringing uh, a vasculitis center to Northwestern University in 2016. It was Jason's passion and his recognition of the need to have a vasculitis center in Chicago, which really drove that movement. So Jason, I'd like to welcome you today and thank you again for joining us. We know you have a very busy schedule. Well, okay. thank you. I always have time for, for you and the team and for the community because it's so important to me. And you and Kaylin and Ed and the rest of the team have been as important in my journey and recovery as the doctors have. So thank you for all you do. Um, I've got about 10 or 15 minutes where I just wanted to share a little bit of my story and um, how it may help others who are going through this, whether you're newly diagnosed or, or you're on the path. And I was told I could swear. So let's just start by saying vasculitis fucking sucks, but it's not something we chose. It chose us. And so it's all about how you choose to deal with it. And so my story is just over 10 years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with vasculitis and I had symptoms for a couple of years before. I'm sure many of you had the same type of, of issues where 
bouncing around doctors who had beliefs, but maybe not an actual diagnosis. I had sinus issues. I had lung issues, difficulty breathing. Uh, I was just sluggish. And then uh, things started to get worse quickly where I started to have issues with my, my skin and I just, I really couldn't move. At that point, uh, I went to see my local doctors and I'm very fortunate. I have what I call the dream team who started to think that this was vasculitis. And I went to a pulmonologist who did an ANCA test. The first ANCA test was positive. And uh, he said, well, that's strange because it's rare. The second one was negative. He said, you know, it was a false positive, the first one. And I said, let's do a tiebreaker. And sure enough, on the third test, it was positive. And I had a decision to make. And I sat down with my primary care doctor. And he said, you're going to have to go on some pretty serious drugs if this is vasculitis, if this is GPA. Um, he said, maybe it's time to do a road trip. And I did my research at that point. And um, what I learned was the NIH uh, which really Dr. Fauci was leading decades ago, had moved their practice from the NIH to Cleveland, uh, to the Cleveland Clinic. And it was Dr. Gary Hoffman who was leading it. And when I did my research, because I live in Chicago and Cleveland had such a stellar reputation, still has a stellar reputation, I wanted to go there. I was very fortunate in that we had a family friend who had a connection there and I got in within 48 hours. My wife and I went. I was diagnosed and my wife said, this is fantastic. We know what it was. And I said, wait a minute, <laughs> this is going to be a long journey for me. I'm not ready to celebrate the diagnosis. And it went on my path. And I'm sure many of you are on your path too with um, all different types of drugs. And it took, took a couple different uh, drugs to get me on the path. It was my methotrexate Fridays where I take my methotrexate and then I pass out over the weekend. I went on Imuran, um, obviously we had prednisone and I, I gained 40 pounds in a couple months and thankfully we've taken a good portion of it off, but it took a while. Um, but what I also learned beyond this, I, I did get you know better after a couple of years and I did have one relapse, is um, I was a pretty private person before and a very active person. So I didn't share much about me uh, my personal life, I didn't see doctors very often. I was a typical guy, you know, it was, uh, if it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. And that was my story. That was my personal journey. Um, I learned a lot of things. Um, I learned to be more um, open. Um, and it's not just about me, it's about others. And to be more compassionate and to share. And um, that was a huge learning for me. There's actually a book that I encourage people to read if you haven't. Uh, Michael J. Fox wrote it years ago called Lucky Man when he was diagnosed. And it talks about how lucky he was when he got his diagnosis because his life was very different before. Good and bad, there's a lot of good that can come out of this. It gives you a lot of perspective. So, you know, that from a, a practical standpoint, I, I credit my wife for pushing me to see doctors, for, for getting out there and, and telling my story. And also that when you have something like vasculitis or a chronic condition, there's no such thing as a small thing to, to not let what, you know, before this diagnosis may have been something you ignored um, to just, you know, stay, in the, stay where it is. You need to go see a doctor if something's coming up. And that it also helps to share your story, not just for other people, but for you. I found that um, I got more sharing my story and helping others than not. And so I truly encourage you to do that. And as, as Joyce said, there are a couple of things I did and still do with the Vasculitis Foundation. And I was really fortunate to find them. Right after my diagnosis with Cleveland, I wanted to start to give back because I didn't know if I was going to be able to continue in my job, I wasn't sure um, if I could work on a daily basis. At that point, I had a, um, a, a digital marketing company, one of the largest in the country with two other partners. And I told them I was gonna be stepping back because I didn't know what my day-to-day -day would be. And so I spent more time working with the Vasculitis Foundation. Joyce and the team were kind enough to invite me onto the board. And some of the things that I saw early on was I said it a couple of times, people were not comfortable telling their story. 
mostly because when they were initially diagnosed, a lot of doctors didn't know what vasculitis was or GPA Wegner's at that point. And so I worked closely with Ed to help people tell their stories. And we came up with extraordinary stories because we felt like, one, people needed to put a megaphone to this condition. So when others found it online and were doing their research, that they would see people who were dealing with something similar to them and they knew they were not alone. The others was start to create awareness. So the more stories we had out there, the more we could fill internet searches and YouTube with stories that were appropriate and, and start to create awareness. The other thing we did um, that we noticed um, as the Vasculitis Foundation was that when you talk about things being rare, um, people don't care. And the reality is we don't necessarily know how rare some of these conditions are. And so I worked with a team to come up with a, a slogan called uh, vasculitis, uh, more common than you think, more serious than you know, to give people that window to say, well, if it's more common and more serious, maybe I should know more about it. And that was just the beginning of, of the path. And, and the team has done an amazing job to create that. But it was really, this is about a community. And everyone on this call and people that are connected to you are part of that community. So the more you can do to strengthen the community, I promise you, the more it's going to do to help you physically, emotionally, spiritually, however you want to look at it. So, you know, for me, moving forward, it did take a lot for me to um, get on the path to health. It took probably five years for me to start to feel better um, through different medications and, and through different doctors. But I was very fortunate um, being at Cleveland Clinic. Um, I, I had some of the, the most uh, amazing doctors and still see them. And something that was important for me is even though Cleveland Clinic was wonderful, it was still a journey to get there. And so something that uh, Joyce and the team and I worked on along with, with Jeff and Karen, Jeff Fishbein and Karen Hirsch, was um, trying to create vasculitis centers that allowed people to travel no more than 250 miles to see an expert. And so that was something that Gary Hoffman, who I mentioned before, when I talked with him, I was fortunate to serve on the board with him. I said, Gary, what is, what is the most important thing that we could do as a foundation? And he said, creating doctors is wonderful. Doing research is wonderful. But creating centers gives you the ability to create doctors who do research and also create awareness in their community. And so that you know, set me on the path of trying to figure out how to create a center. And we were fortunate where um, here in Chicago, there really was not a dedicated vasculitis center. And so we created a group to identify which hospitals would be a good fit. We found three hospitals that were open and we actually had a bit of a competition and Northwestern um, really said, we are dedicated to doing this both from a uh, putting people against it as well as putting funds and we helped fund it as well and it was a model that was different for the vasculitis foundation and i credit uh, the doctors that you're going to hear on this call they were instrumental in helping to to get it right both both uh, dr peters um, as well as joyce and team and i will say that northwestern has been an amazing partner an amazing model for the future and we hope to do more centers in the future so we can help people who need to get on their path both for the newly diagnosed and for people who have recurring issues so i guess my my message overall is uh vasculitis sucks we know that but it's all about how you are able to approach it and attack it and please um share your story please um, know that you're not alone and uh, you have a great support team with the vasculitis foundation you have a great support team with your doctors find vasculitis specialists wherever they may be hopefully they're they're close by um, but i encourage you to to really be an advocate 
for yourself. And once you're able to to be an advocate for yourself on in a healthy way, then also be an advocate for the community. Thank you. And I'd love to take any questions that may have come through the chat. Hey, Jason, um, thank you so much for that great presentation. I guess I, I, I guess I've known you for a long time and your kids were pretty young. I'm sorry, George. I know a long time, <laughs> um, but your kids were pretty young when you were diagnosed and now they're uh, one's going off to college in a few days. Um, right. What do you do you have any thoughts about how you because they volunteered for the organization, they helped you with the bowling alley and stuff like uh, the bowling tournament. How did right. you how did you talk with the kids about it? Well, it's very funny. We were on the plane last night. I was with the two of them and I said, so I have this call you know, tomorrow morning, um, how do you feel um, vasculitis affected me? And they, what surprised me is they don't, they don't remember me much before vasculitis. They would say, um, cause I, I couldn't get off the couch for a long time. Dad was lazy. Um, you know, he won't play with us. And um, when I decided, well, when I got on the path to health and when I decided to do more within the vasculitis foundation or for the vasculitis community, I couldn't have been more proud of them because they stepped up and wanted to be part of it as well. And so we did that rally in the alley with Karen here and we raised um, over five years, we raised a couple hundred thousand dollars, which was wonderful. Some of it went to the, the Northwestern, um, you know, building the, the Northwestern Vasculitis Center, but um, they wanted to, to be part of it. And I will tell you, I my belief is they wanted to be part of it because they saw not only what I was going through, but they went to some conferences and they saw what other people were going through. And it helped them learn at a very early age that it's not just about them, it's about others and how they can support other people as they're going through their journey. Because the reality is you don't know what people have going on in their lives and it helps you to get outside of yourself and see that. So um, I think they really benefited you know, in the long term from this. And like I said, I mean, I, I hopefully it's made them more aware and um, more compassionate. Yes, that's so beautiful. Um, somebody else asked about your career. So you had to do a step, you know, you met with your partners and said, hey, I'm going to have to step back. But do you feel like you've, did you lose a lot? Do you feel like you've regained what you had to step back from for a little while? I got more from it than I could have imagined. And, you know, that was the thing for me was stepping outside of myself because up until that point, I was really focused on, on my career and, and me and always tried to help other people, but not to the level of awareness that I got to when I was hit with vasculitis. I, because I took more of a step back from my day to day, I started to ask what I could do to help others and get involved in other businesses and it was always like you had mentioned about the sole partnership. It was never about just making money. It was about making a difference and helping other people. And so I started to get involved in different boards, different advisories. And I met so many people and um, it just kind of built this network of, of opportunities that I could never have imagined. The Vasculitis Foundation has actually benefited from one of them. I, through a couple of different um, things I was involved in, I met um, someone who became a good friend, the person who created the band Survivor and wrote the song, Eye of the Tiger, uh, Jim Peterick. And he has been very gracious. He's performed at uh, the bowling events. He's performed at vasculitis conferences, and he's been an advocate for vasculitis. I never would have met him if I was not diagnosed with vasculitis. I can trace back the, the steps that it went through unplanned where I got to meet him and, and have him become a friend. So I think part of it is just being out there with your story because um, people wanna know your story, people wanna help you. And the more you do that, the more you will get. And the more, the more you give, it's true, the more you give, the more you get. And I truly believe that. Great. Okay, so that's beautiful. Let's end on that. And I do love Jim and all his uh, music. So I think it's so fun that I know him through you. Um, so 
Jason, thank you so much for uh, getting up early this morning. I know you've got a, a full weekend and another week ahead, but thank you so much for joining us today and uh, sharing your thoughts and your experiences. Have a great day. And thank you, Joyce and team. Be well. You're welcome. Take care. Bye. So, okay, Kaylin, are we ready to launch the uh, first poll of the day? We absolutely are. So we're going to launch a poll and we ask that you participate and just respond to the question because it's going to lead us into our next presenter, Dr. Peter Grayson. So the first poll is, what is the number one factor that affects long-term survival of vasculitis in men? Uh, Kidney disease, prednisone use, cardiovascular disease, blood clots, high cholesterol. So if everybody can respond, uh, we will move on. Um, We've got about 30 seconds to answer. Looks like everybody's weighing in um, on what they think. Okay, so Dr. Grayson, there's your answers. 42% for kidney, 32% for prednisone, 26% for cardiovascular. And blood clots and high cholesterol did not get any votes. So let's move on to our next speaker. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Peter Grayson, who is the principal investigator of the vasculite of the NIAMS vasculitis translational research program at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Grayson's research focuses on clinical and translational research across many forms of systemic vasculitis. Specifically, his work has focused on biomarker discovery and development, the use of advanced molecular imaging, molecular classification of disease, clinical trials, and genetics genomics of vasculitis. His group has clinically defined the use of advanced molecular imaging as a surrogate marker of vascular vascular inflammation in large vessel vasculitis. His group has also conducted some of the only translational work related to relapsing polychondritis, including the identification of somatic mutations in UBA1 as a driver of disease in a subset of these patients. Dr. Grayson just retired from the VF Board of Directors in May after many, many years of service. And I just want to thank him for all of his time, his dedication to helping our patients, to helping the organization, to helping me um, in my work. So Dr. Grayson, you have the floor. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. As Joyce mentioned, I work at the NIH and we uh, run a vasculitis research program there that's welcome to anybody around the country and around the world to come and spend some time with us and participate in vasculitis research. Um, Today though, I'm really gonna talk more from a clinical perspective because I know you're gonna hear a bit later about research initiatives related to, to men with vasculitis. So I was tasked to talk to you about the impact of vasculitis on men's health And Ed Becker gave me some questions a few days ago that many of you had asked. So I tried to use those to shape the areas that I would cover. This is by no means a comprehensive talk. I just wanted to hit a few high points that seem to be uh, questions that we tend to hear from men with this disease. Um, So the four things I really want to cover is talk to you a little bit about the types of vasculitis that tend to affect men, because as you'll see, some forms of vasculitis really exclusively affect women and others are are more likely to affect men. And what is that teaching us about these diseases? Uh, As the poll question alluded to, we're gonna talk about survival and and what are the factors that improve uh, your chances of living a long, full, healthy life uh, despite having vasculitis. Um, Many people ask about fertility issues, so we'll cover that. And then uh, it wouldn't be 2021 without discussing COVID-19. So I'm going to have a brief little bit on that at the end. Um, Because I recognize that there's people here that likely have many different kinds of vasculitis, I just wanted to make sure we all had that global understanding together that vasculitis really refers to inflammation in arteries, but there are many, many different forms of it. And it comes in different flavors depending on the types of blood vessels that are affected. 
Some of you may have small vessel vasculitis, which is a group of diseases that includes um, ANCA-associated vasculitis, so patients with GPA, EGPA, MPA, but there's also a lot of other forms of small vessel vasculitis, things like IgA vasculitis, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis. And what uh, really defines this is the tiny blood vessels in the body are inflamed, and that tends to cause symptoms in the skin, which you're seeing here, in the lungs and in the kidneys, as well as the eyes and other types of uh, small vessel organ involvement. On the other end of that spectrum is large vessel vasculitis. Uh, and these prototypical diseases are things like giant cell arteritis, which is the most common form of vasculitis in the United States, uh, and Takayasu's arteritis, which is pretty rare. Um, but this is inflammation of the large arteries, the aorta and the arteries to your arms, to your legs, to, in your neck. And then somewhere in between is medium vessel vasculitis. Those are kind of more of the rare forms, uh, which polyarteritis nodosa is one of the main versions of that. So uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about these types of vasculitis. I'm going to really try to address commonalities that I think apply to all of these different forms. Um, so the first question is, you know, I am a man, I have vasculitis. Uh, what does this disease do? Are there differences in sex um, in, in who gets vasculitis and the symptoms people get? Um, and it's really interesting because for any um, disease, you can look at prevalence in men versus women. And there tends to be some themes when you do that. Um, oddly enough, diseases of inflammation that tend to affect the entire body, um, like vasculitis, those tend to occur primarily in women. And we are learning over time, it's likely because women's immune systems are a bit different than men. So when we think about disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, some of the more common diseases in rheumatology, those are very much seen uh, primarily in women, not in men. Um, so where does vasculitis fall in the spectrum? There are certain forms of vasculitis that are much more common in men and certain that are much less. So ANCA associated vasculitis, it's about equal, uh, equal men to women ratio and who gets the disease. Uh, giant cell arteritis, a bit more women than men, and then all the way to a disease like Takayasu's arteritis, which is about eight to nine women for every men that have the disease. Um, so why is this stuff important? Well, it, it may be important because uh, there's likely to be different factors that are driving these diseases in men versus women. To date, we don't do anything in terms of treatment that's different if you're a man versus a woman. So for example, if you have GPA, the way that we tend to treat that disease isn't really divided along gender lines or sex lines. If you're a man or a woman, you're going to get the same types of treatment. But in the future, if we can understand the underpending of the diseases, it's poten we potentially could target treatment differently. And what I wanted to let you know about is to give you hope that these kind of epidemiologic insights, understanding who gets the disease, um, whether it affects men versus women, can really give us clues about cause. And a really exciting story came out of the NIH last year about a brand new type of vasculitis. And this vasculitis was just discovered and characterized and it only affects men and it has a lot to teach us. So the disease is called Vexus syndrome. And this is a, uh, a figure of the typical symptoms with a patient who has Vexus. And you'll notice this is a man and he's got gray hair because so it's a disease of older men. This disease starts exclusively in patients who are 40 or older. And why am I telling you about this at a vasculitis conference? Well, it actually is hiding out in different forms of vasculitis. So in small numbers of patients who have ANCA associated vasculitis, they actually have this disease vexus. We've also find it hiding in relapsing polychondritis, which is a disease of cartilage. We found it hiding out in patients we thought had polyarteritis nodosa, but actually have vexus syndrome. And even in cases where we thought they had giant cell arteritis and it was this new disease, vexus. So if you are an older man who had vasculitis in one of these types that started maybe in your 50s, 60s and beyond, you should listen because this may apply to you. Um, so why is this a disease that only happens in men? Well, it turns out it's due to a mutation on an X-linked gene. 
And that's where understanding sex differences in vasculitis may give us research clues that may allow us to understand what's causing diseases. So uh, a man only has one X chromosome, a woman have two X chromosome. In this disease, there's a mutation on the X. And because women have two, if one of their X genes gets mutated, they're protected by their second unmutated gene. Whereas a man only have one X chromosome, if there's a mutation on it, they're likely to get this disease. Um, so you may ask yourself, well, this is a, you used to tell me this is a mutation. Maybe I got it from my parents. And all the, most of the times, if I inherit a bad mutation, I should get a disease that starts when I'm pretty young. Uh, but these patients don't have disease till they're 40, 50, 60 years old. So why is this disease starting late? Well, it turns out that this mutation, um, actually, you're not born with it. You didn't inherit it from your parents. You acquired it later in life. And it's a mutation that's only found in your blood cells. So as your blood cells divide, they can acquire this mutation and it can cause vasculitis that looks like a lot of these common vasculitides that we talk about. Um, why is that cool? Because we can cure this. Um, if we do, and there have been a couple of patients now with this syndrome who've received bone marrow transplantation and eradicated the cells that have the mutation and have been cured of disease. So um, how do you spot this disease? Well, it, it has a very characteristic look. Um, it, in addition to having vasculitis, because there's a mutation in blood, over time, they have bone marrow failure. So your blood counts start to drop very low. These are patients who've had ANCA-associated vasculitis in their 50s, and then they start to require blood transfusions. So I don't expect many of you or any of you to potentially have this disease, but if that does sound like you, then please get in touch because you should be genetically screened for this condition. But why I'm telling you about this is because we can start to understand the way vasculitis affects men versus women. That can give us clues as to what's causing these things. And when we find out cause, then that's what puts us at the doorstep of, of finding cures. Okay, so what about survival? Uh, how do patients with vasculitis do? How long are you going to live? How is this going to affect your long-term function and health? The good news here is that every study that's looked at this in the recent era has shown that patients with vasculitis are living longer. In fact, in one recent study, they looked at death in patients with vasculitis who were admitted to the hospital, and the death rates have declined by 43% over the last two decades. All of this speaks to the fact that there's better treatments, there's just better hospital management in general, um, and that we're understanding uh, in which patients to be more or less aggressive with treatment and for how long patients should be treated. And as we get better and better at this, I think the mortality rate in vasculitis is gonna approach what's seen in just age-matched populations. Um, you won't die from your disease, you'll die from something else. And that's the goal. But the news isn't as good for men. So if you look at survival, survival in women with vasculitis has improved at a faster rate than survival in men. And so why is that? Why aren't men doing as well as women on average with this disease? And to answer that question, you have to think about um, what are patients with vasculitis dying from? When a patient with vasculitis does eventually die, what's the cause of death? And I can tell you the great news here is they're not really dying from their disease as much. We are getting this disease under control with medications. But there are other factors that are contributing to why a patient with vasculitis eventually dies. And if you go to research conferences, you know, we have these poster sessions and you'll see a lot of researchers, they're interested in one form of vasculitis and the headline of their poster will say, you know, predictor of death in patient with this type of vasculitis. And when you look at those posters, almost always the conclusion is two factors. There's two main things that in the long term contribute to increased death in a patient with vasculitis. The first one is cardiovascular disease, and the second one is infections. And infections likely are related to, in part, to the fact that we use immunosuppressing medications. We use medications to weaken your immune system, to calm it down a bit, to control the vasculitis, and in doing so, it puts patients at increased risk for infections. Um, we're getting better and better with that, and the drugs are getting more and more targeted. So I think the infectious rates are going to continue to go down. But cardiovascular disease is the one that I wanted to focus on, because this, I think, is the link to why men with vasculitis aren't surviving on average as long as women. And we know that cardiovascular disease in general is the number one cause of death in men, independent of whether or not they have 
um, vasculitis. So what do I mean by cardiovascular disease? I mean, aging blood vessels. I mean, atherosclerosis, cholesterol, plaque disease in your arteries that is leading uh, to things like heart attacks and stroke. And for men with vasculitis, this is particularly a, an issue because you already have a disease of the blood vessels. So this is a set, if you have cardiovascular disease on top of your vasculitis, you're at really at increased risk for bad outcomes. So what can you do? Well, this stuff is not sexy, but it's really important. And it's preventative medicine to reduce the cardiovascular risk that you have. Um, I think that the number one thing is don't smoke. And if you are smoking to stop, it's the best thing that you can do to improve your long-term survival with vasculitis is to not smoke or to quit if you're, if you're doing it. I know many of you have tried to quit and have been unsuccessful, but the data shows that the next time you try, you're more likely to be successful. So if you are smoking tobacco, uh, I think it's really important to stop. Uh, and then the other thing is regular checkups with your primary care doctor. And one thing, one trap you may fall into is you say, well, I see my vasculitis doctor regularly and they're kind of my main doctor. So I really don't need to see anybody else because I see them enough. So they're looking at things. But what the data shows is that your, your vasculitis doctor is often focused and keyed in on the vasculitis symptoms. They're not necessarily doing the best of jobs looking at all of your other routine health maintenance things. This is the job of your primary care doctor, and it's why I think it's really important that you have one if you have vasculitis. Um, because it's the job of the primary care doctor to start looking at your blood pressure. Is that optimized? This is reducing your cardiovascular risk. Good blood pressure control, good cholesterol control, and the best one, the, the most magic drug there is, diet and exercise. And of course, I think talking to your doctor about exercise regimens that are healthy and appropriate for you is really important. Um, this is the key to living a longer life with vasculitis. The doctors, we're getting better at managing the inflammation parts of the disease. This is the stuff that you need to do if you really want a long, healthy, functional life. Okay, fertility issues also come up quite a bit. Um, and we tend to think about fertility and pregnancy more from the perspective of women with vasculitis than with men, but it's just equally as important an issue in men because it takes two to tango. So the one drug that should be on the radar that really is um, uh, associated with uh, infertility is cyclophosphamide. So men who get uh, cyclophosphamide when they're you know 20s, teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s, they may have issues with infertility. It doesn't always happen, but this is the, the, of the drugs that we use, this is the biggest culprit for causing decreased sperm counts and issues with being able to conceive a child. So if you are being put on cyclophosphamide, it's really important that you talk to your physician about options that you may have if fertility issues are a big concern with you. And I can tell you, we don't do a great job as physicians bringing these up with our patients and we should do better. There are options. You could do cryopreservation of sperm or sperm banking. Um, it is a bit expensive and there's different ways to do it, um, but it is an option that should be discussed. There are also a lot of other medications that we use that weaken the immune system that are designed to treat vasculitis. And the bottom line with these medications is that they may decrease fertility to certain degrees. It is still very possible to conceive a child if you're taking a medication for your vasculitis as a man. It just may take, it may be a little bit more difficult. Um, but interestingly enough, while we pay a lot of attention to women who are taking certain medications because they're teratogenic, meaning that they will cause birth defects in a fetus, that doesn't tend to apply with, to men. Uh, so the, a lot of the society recommendations for men who are taking medications is that if they're trying to conceive that they should remain on their medications. So it may be harder conce to conceive, but it is safe to conceive while taking these medicines. And then finally, I will touch on COVID-19, uh, particularly given the fact that we've had a recent surge in cases. And what I want you to be aware of is that uh, there are risk factors for bad outcomes in COVID-19. And one of them, unfortunately, is male sex. So men are 2.4 times more likely to die than women, according to data aggregated from the CDC, uh, if they get infected with COVID-19. And uh, we know more and more about how patients with vasculitis are doing when they get COVID-19, and, and most of them are doing quite well. But there can be bad outcomes, particularly patients who are on high levels of prednisone or other immunosuppressing drugs. 
The other thing that we're learning is that patients with vasculitis on treatment and specifically certain treatments may not respond as well to the vaccines. So they may not get as robust protection from the vaccines. The vaccines have been extraordinarily effective at preventing death from COVID-19. This may not be as uh, much the case in patients with uh, autoimmune diseases or inflammatory diseases who are taking medications to treat their illness. So the bottom line here is to remain careful, be careful with your contacts, be careful in following CDC guidelines, get vaccinated. I don't really foresee any major complication to a patient with vasculitis that would prevent them from getting vaccinated. Obviously this should be discussed directly with your doctor, but in general, uh, most patients with vac vasculitis should be getting vaccinated. Um, and then be on the lookout and watch for news about a, a booster shot. There have been no recommendations about this yet, but where people are looking is in patients who are potentially immunocompromised, who don't have as likelihood of having a great response to the vaccine, these may be the patients that need a booster. And finally, if you are a patient with vasculitis on immunosuppressing medications and you get COVID-19, particularly if you have a mild to moderate case and you're early on in being diagnosed within that 10 day window of symptom onset, you are a candidate for monoclonal antibodies. Um, and the, there's emergency use of these. And one of the indications is patients who are on immunosuppressant treatment. So I would, uh, if you do happen to contract COVID-19, this is a discussion that you should raise with your physician, whether or not you would qualify to get monoclonal antibodies as a treatment for it. Um, so with that, I will thank you for your attention. This is my Twitter handle if you're into the Twitter and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Grayson, so much for that excellent talk. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, one, uh, one person asked, um, with the infection risk, can, sur can surgery be safe? And I know it's a very short question. I don't know if you can address that. Well, I think that um, the idea of surgery in vasculitis is a broad topic, and, and, but there are a few things that are sort of general truths. One is that if you, if you have to have an emergent surgery, you need the surgery, in which case your surgeons need to know that you have vasculitis. They need to know what medications you're taking, particularly if you're on a lot of steroids, because the steroids may have to be managed a certain way around the time of surgery. If, however, you're talking about elective surgeries, then really one of the main things is to try to do that surgery when your vasculitis is under really good control, because that will improve the chance of your outcomes. You know, think medications like, like prednisone can cause challenges around um, surgeries with wound healing, with infection rates and things like this. So really having a team of people thinking about your case before an elective procedure is, is important. Um, but there's no reason that patients with vasculitis can't undergo successful surgical procedures for whatever they may need. It just may require a little bit more planning. Okay, great. Thank you. Another question that came in was, um, uh, do steroids affect men differently than women? Do they tolerate them differently? I think we could ask some wives that question. We yeah, I would put that answers. <laughs> I would put that to the patients. I think Honestly, my, my experience with treating a lot of patients with, with steroids is that one of three things kind of tends to happen, and it doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman. One is they tolerate them and they actually don't really have much of an immediate impact and side effect. That's, you know, rare, but it does happen. There are people, people that can take steroids and it doesn't, doesn't make them feel any different. The other things that can happen is if you tend to be more on the depressed or blue side of the spectrum, it can exacerbate that. It can make you feel depressed and sad. And these are things that would, you know, you definitely want to review and discuss with your physician. If on the other hand, you tend to be more on the hyper end of the spectrum, it can make you extremely active, uh, difficult to sleep, mind racing, these kinds of things. And that to me feels to be more of the spectrum of response to prednisone than, than gender, I'm sure, or than sex. I'm sure that there's differences in the way um, different people uh, feel and want to express how they're feeling. I think the key thing though, is if you're on glucocorticoids or steroids, 
is talking to your doctor about those symptoms that you have, making sure you feel comfortable to bring them up because there are ways to manage those. If you feel depressed, if you can't sleep, if you're having problems with anger, there are other ways to sort of mitigate those side effects. And some of it is even just the ways in which we lower and the speed and how we taper the steroids can be really helpful in those situations. It's not necessarily additional medications for those side effects too, but sometimes that is also necessary. So the bottom line, I think, is just good communication with your doctor uh, when you're taking those medications. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple uh, people uh, submitted about testicular pain. Um, who should they talk to about that? I mean, is that something they bring up with a rheumatologist or family physician? Does that, should they go to a urologist, someone like that? Um, well, so there, I should take a step back and say that vasculitis can affect the penis and the testicles. It can be a feature of your vasculitis. So raising, if you're having discomfort, um, raising that issue with your doctor and your vasculitis doctor is important. Um, it tends to happen when the rest of the disease is active and it tends to happen in certain forms of vasculitis more than others. So people with polyuretinitis nodosa, testicular involvement is, is somewhat common in that disease. You can have uh, involvement in anca associated vasculitis too. It's a bit rare, but it can happen. So I do think that, um, you know, it, there could be a number of reasons why you may have those types of symptoms. It, it's important to raise them with your doctor because it may be directly related to your vasculitis or it may not. If it is directly re related to your vasculitis, it is treatable and it should be addressed. That's, that's the main reason to bring it up. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to mention that Kaylin Larson is developing uh, with Dr. Megan Close from uh, Duke, a pregnancy and fertility guide uh, for our patients. And that should be out in the next month or so. So I, I think, um, so I'm very excited about your Vexus, um, the information on Vexus. And I wanted to ask you again, just if, if a patient thinks that maybe they should be evaluated for Vexus, should they just contact you at the NIH? Would that be the best thing? Yeah. So it's a new disease. So it's in flux of how you get diagnosed. We do genetic testing at the NIH for free, but we would have to coordinate it with your doctors. So if, if you think you may have this, bring, bring it to the attention of your doctor, or you can contact us directly and we can help facilitate that process. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Um, Dr. Grayson, thank you so much for joining us. We know you have busy weekends. You have three kids, a dog, a wife. Um, I'm sure you have lots of responsibilities. So thank you again for taking time this morning to, to speak with our group and have a great weekend. Thanks for having me. The next group on the, the next session is our um, How to Be a Weekend Warrior with Vasculitis. And I'm very excited to introduce our, um, we have two speakers for this uh, session. Uh, Brandon Hutchins, and Art Diaz. And Art is joining us from California. He got up really early this morning to join us, so I appreciate that, Art. Um, Brandon's in North Carolina, but um, let me introduce you. Um, Art Diaz is a 52-year-old married man with uh, two children, and he lives in uh, Garden Grove, California. He is a retail manager of a Skechers store. He's an avid runner. He was diagnosed with GPA in 2017, and I feel like he may discuss this, but he was very fortunate. Even though he was very sick, he got a pretty quick diagnosis, which I think was is really important as you look at how patients get diagnosed, how quickly, and how that helps with the recovery. But as an avid runner, he had to stop running. Um, he spent three months off work trying to recuperate, and he'll probably He'll probably spend some time right now talking about that. Um, since his diagnosis, Art has gotten involved with the Vasculitis Foundation. He met Brandon at one of the symposiums. They share a very great love of running and exercise. Um, and Art also volunteers with um, as our vasculitis representative on our NORD Rare Disease um, committee, which works to work with state governments across the country to raise awareness of rare disease and the impact that it does have on our patients and families. 
My other uh, guest for this session is Brandon Hutchins, who many of you know as the Victory Over Vasculitis founder and organizer. Brandon uh, was a professional runner until just June when he retired. He hung up his professional running shoes, which although I'm sure he's still running how many out, who knows how many miles a week. But uh, Brandon, I wanted to thank you for joining us. He was diagnosed in 2008. He actually was uh, training for the Olympics in 2016, and then again in 2020, when the Olympics got delayed. And then um, for the 2021 Olympics, he was training for that this spring, and then made the ultimate decision to retire. But I would like to welcome both Brandon and Art to the session, and I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And Brandon, you have some slides to show, I believe. Yes, I do. Oh. Uh, I think this is a very important um topic here uh after dr grayson's talk um especially and i and i actually did not know um that cardiovascular disease uh in men especially was the uh the number one indicator um of long-term complications basically with with um, outcome. So with that said, exercising is basically the number one thing that we can do, um, to control cardiovascular disease and health. Um, and this is kind of off the slides and I had no clue that, that, uh, Grayson was going to actually go over that. Uh, so that ties in very nicely with, with our discussion here. Um, but this is just kind of some basics of kind of what is exercise, um, as a coach, as, uh, an exercise scientist, um, I think it's, it's very important um, for us to kind of define what exercise is exactly. Um, all of us kind of have a different idea in our head, a little bit of what it, of exactly what it is, because for all of us, it, it looks a little bit different. Um, for crazy people like Art and I, that means we run a lot. Uh, for other people, that might mean, you know, going for a, a hike in the woods. It might mean uh, playing pickup basketball at the YMCA. It might be doing yoga. Uh, but, uh, the, there's basically at the end of the day, there's four different modalities, um, that are, uh, considered exercise. Um, you're either going to be doing something that's endurance based, something that's strength based, uh, something that's balance based or something that's flexibility based. So endurance is going to be stuff like walking, running, hiking, cycling, swimming, uh, things that are going to work on cardiovascular health, uh, strength, strength is going to be stuff like strength training, uh, CrossFit, weightlifting, uh, band work, stuff like that. Balance is, is a little bit trickier, but uh, both the first two modalities, endurance and strength, can also help with your balance a little bit. Um, but balance is really going to be working on um, neurological uh, innervations in the muscles. So it makes your, your muscles a little bit stronger and allows you to contract more muscles, which allows you to maintain your balance a little bit better. And then ultimately flexibility uh, slash mobility, which is the ability to move your body th uh, joints through their full range of motion. Um, I, I, I don't think so much uh, about being able to touch your toes, but I actually being able to um, move your joints through their full range of motion. Uh, so it's not about necessarily the one single flexibility of, uh, a system of certain muscle groups, but more the ability of your body's joints to, to move through their full range of motion. Um, and yes, it's super important, um, uh, for vasculitis patients to exercise. Um, now what that's going to look like, um, as Dr. Grayson said, the, the first thing is that, um, you need to have a discussion with your doctor. Uh, and then from there, it's about listening to your body and kind of figuring out what, what modalities and what types of exercise might be right for you. Um, one thing that I like to tell for my people of, um, is exercise is tough. Um, but it's the one thing that we can guarantee, uh, that <laughs> it can basically do what we all wish a magic pill would do, which is increase your mood, reduce inflammation, decrease all cause mortality and improve your quality of life. Um, if we could bottle all that up in a pill and sell that to, to people, um, Art and I would be billionaires uh, and be able to fund everything the Vasculitis Foundation wants to do. But uh, with that said, it is the one thing um, that can guarantee that, that you um, have a longer quality of life. Um, it, it's fantastic at that. Um, so without further ado, um, why exercise? Um, 
vasculitis is an inflammation disease. Now, obviously exercise does not cure it, but uh, as little as single, a single bout of 20 minutes of light treadmill walking has been shown to reduce inflammation, general inflammation markers in the blood um, by 5%. And that should be an indicator to um, all of us that like, you don't have to do something um, wild like art now, which is go for runs of miles and miles and miles. Something as simple as a light walk around the neighborhood for 15 or 20 minutes can help you reduce some of those inflammation markers. Um, as uh, Dr. Grayson and Jason both alluded to, uh, managing stress with rare disease patients is uh, extremely important because uh, living with a rare disease uh, causes a lot of anxiety and depression. And I, I've discussed uh, I probably too much at times, uh, my own battles with them. Uh, both of those, both anxiety and depression, um, anxiety from dealing with the fact that every little sniffle you get, uh, or every little, um, thing that can go wrong can, can make living with a rare disease really, really tough. Um, and then that anxiety kind of snowballing into a depression and feeling like that, um, living down in the dumps and in the blue and feeling like, um, there's not really a space for you in life and that, life is not like you want it. And that can be, uh, incredibly tough. Um, while medications have, have been helpful and I've actually been on several, uh, antidepressant medications over the years. Um, multiple studies have shown that exercise, um, to be equally as effective at reducing markers of anxiety, stress, and, and panic attacks. Um, around stress. And the thing is, is like, we can't cure this disease. Um, and dealing with the mental health aspect of it, um, medications are certainly helpful and effective. And they sort of, as I said, rolled the dial back for me. Um, but having exercise and working, working to understand uh, my own pitfalls and my own weaknesses uh, around dealing with anxiety and depression and, and trying to treat those and recognizing that like, hey, this is situational. I'm dealing with anxiety and depression because like I have a really difficult life living as a rare disease patient and I have to, I have to fix those and I have to work on those. And uh, exercise has been a vehicle that has allowed me to do that. Um, one of the other important things that's uh, important to remember uh, when dealing with uh, symptoms and the medications that we're on as vasculitis patients, uh, often dealing with such inflammation and the corticosteroids that we're all on, uh, you're going to have severe reduced strength um, in the muscles, and you're also going to be at risk uh, for a decrease in bone density, uh, thanks to one of the side effects of, of prednisone. Um, so it's important for regular weight, weight bearing exercise to uh, maintain your muscle strength and also to keep your bone density up. Um, lifting weights is uh, one of the best ways to increase bone density. Uh, in fact, um, if you don't load the bones, um, it the bones basically turn to to sponges and uh, we want them to be nice and rigid. So the greater load, the higher the benefit um, as far as bone density is concerned. Uh, the last thing that I think is super important that exercise can help, um, with, uh, dealing with all of, uh, the complications from vasculitis and dealing with the side effects of a lot of medication is increased sleep quality. Um, when you exercise, you stimulate your body's, um, recuperative process during sleep. This helps your body get into a deeper sleep and more restorative and regenerative states of sleep. Uh, our bodies at civil war. Uh, when we have vasculitis and we need rest, we need recovery. We need to allow our body to heal. And the best way to do that is to sleep. That's when the most healing happens. That's when the most recovery happens. And unless we sleep, those processes are never going to happen. Um, just exercising a, a, a few times a week has shown to drastically increase people's quality of sleep. And when, with that being the greatest period of time when we're going to heal and repair ourselves. Uh, it's super important that we, we get our sleep. So, and exercise is shown to increase that quality of sleep as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Art here. Um, and uh, Art has been a fantastic uh, ambassador for the Victory Over Vasculitis campaign. Here he is kind of with the, uh, his Skid Row running group out in Southern California with a bunch of victory over, over vasculitis t-shirts on. Um, and he's been a tremendous inspiration to me, 
Um, it, as, uh, as Jason alluded to earlier in the, uh, in the talk, I started the victory over vasculitis campaign in 2016, trying to inspire patients and had no clue the level of inspiration I was going to get back, um, from the other patients and, and art has been one of those. So, uh, art, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. Um, here's just kind of a slide of art's path and we'll let him, let him chat about his experiences. Okay, um, so Brandon covered why we um, exercise, but um, what does exercise as a vas vasculitis, vasculitis patient look like? Uh, mine is more of a you know simple testimony. Our results are going to um, vary from person to person, but the bottom line is we can all benefit um, from exercising. So um, what is the process of getting back to exercise? It's been mentioned here a few times but please consult with your doctor to get a physical assessment. We're all gonna be at different stages or levels um, in dealing with um, vasculitis, but first and foremost, get a um, consultation with your doctor. Uh, secondly, um, it's really important to listen to your own body. Again, we're all gonna be at various stages. There is no right or wrong answer in terms of when I should be um, recovering back to exercise, go at your own pace. I know for me, um, exercise was completely out of the question, question when I first got diagnosed, you know, I was, you know, either on the couch or on the bed, um, using a walker or a cane. So it was, um, several months before I can even, um, begin, um, walking. So really go slow, build gradually. And again, listen to your body. Um, when you know the time is right, you're going to know for me, I just simply went out for um, simple walks until I felt comfortable. And then you just do it a little gradually. Um, eventually I did the, uh, you know, the run walk technique um, and just went at my own pace and really give your credit, give yourself credit for the smallest efforts. I, prior to being diagnosed for vasculitis would be able to run, you know, five, six miles. I could barely even walk, let alone running. So for me, when that, I, I would get up and go running, just walking up the block, run back, walk again, do that a few times. That was a huge, huge, um, um, victory. So give yourself credit and, um, again, build gradually. Uh, I think the second thing is really to build a routine, um, kind of like anything else we do in life, schedule it, um, put it on paper. I know for me, I like to put it on paper. I have my set uh, routine days that I run my days that I, I, I don't run or rest. Um, statistically, you're more likely going to uh, exercise if you put it on paper. If you set in your mind, I'm going to, you know, exercise somewhere two, three times a week, it's probably not going to happen. I know for me, I put it on a paper, I jot down my results, how far I may have run, and it's going to be a lot easier to chart your growth, your success, and definitely you're going to get more um, um, better results just by, by scheduling it. Um, make it a social activity. Um, you know, there's a lot of run clubs out there. Given the situation we are now, you know, maybe that may not be feasible for you, but within your own uh, family, hey, take, take your uh, wife or kids or close friends and just go out for uh, a simple walk. That will, will uh, do a lot to, to build your um, momentum um, and make it fun. Um, a little bit of activity is better than nothing. You know, Brandon alluded to, you know, maybe not all of us gonna be able to run, ride a bike or swim but just going out for um, a simple walk, you know, maybe taking out the trash, um, watering the plants, some type of activity, some type of movement is gonna be um, be beneficial for you. Um, the third bu bullet point and, uh, and this really key is the mental benefits. I often have said as a vasculitis patient, if physically, yes, it can take a toll on your body, but mentally as well. For me, I've, I've found that it's more mental than physical. I've often said um, vasculitis is 49% physical and 51% mental. You know, there's the anxiety, the depression, isolation. We all go through that. Um, so there's many, many benefits from, from um, exercising. I uh, was just sitting on a uh, vasculitis call with some vasculitis patients the other day and they, and the topic of exercise came up and a couple of them mentioned they just go out for a simple walk and how basically it boosts their mood. It just elevates their, their mood. So just even going out for a brisk, simple walk will, will do a lot. And then um, again, to, uh, going back to the anxiety, the stress, depression, I for one um, feel I'm in a better position where I am, um, say, when I initially got diagnosed, it's been four years since I got diagnosed. 
Is it easy? Absolutely not. Am I an expert in vasculitis? No, but I like to think I'm in a you know better position today than I was, say, um, four years ago in, in dealing with this disease. And again, it, it can be very, very um, um, mental, um, the stress, the anxiety, the isolation. So there are many, many, many benefits to um, exercising. And again, um, in summary, everybody is going to be at different le levels of what they can do. But the bottom line, exercising as a vasculitis patient is going to benefit us so, so much as I, I, I can attest to. Um, that's pretty much a um, summary. Again, just make sure you get a physical assessment with your doctor. Go at your pace. There is no right or wrong um, answer. Um, and then mostly just celebrate your victories on, on what, what can you can do and know your, your limitations. Um, that's our presentations. If there are any questions, we'll be happy to take them at this time. Great, Brandon and Art, thank you so much for both your presentations and your suggestions. So we do have a few questions. Um, so one person asked, I'm a runner. I was marathon training before it hit. I am trying to regain the distance I had. However, once I reach a mile, I drop again to barely being able to move. Also, my legs get numb and sore when I start running. Any suggestions or thoughts? And I think this is something that a lot of our patients face. So do you, one of you want to tackle this? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start and Art, if you have anything to add, um, I, I've been in that same position and Art's been in that same position, you know, as somebody that was an elite level athlete before they got diagnosed, I, I got to the point where I too had to, I literally couldn't run for more than five or 10 seconds at the very, very most without having to stop and literally sit down. Uh, I've been able to obviously build back up, um, over time to, to being able to run again. But it, as Art kind of said during his thing is it, it's starting slow and biting off uh, chunks that you can handle. Uh, and I always started in, cause like, you know, I've had several relapses and during those relapses, de depending on the severity of them, I've either been able to kind of keep jogging at kind of, you know, a, a, a decent pace. I'm um, not, obviously what I would be when I was healthy, but I would still be able to jog for 15 or 20 minutes and be able to handle that. Um, but there's been times that I had to completely restart and work up to even be able to run a whole mile again. Um, so what I did, and this is what I even recommend for people that are new runners is, um, and I, I didn't come up with this, uh, Je uh Jeff Galloway, uh, literally started what's called the Galloway run walk method, uh, which is literally running and walking. And, you know, I would, I would set out a time like, Hey, I'm going to go out for 30 minutes today. I'm going to run as much of it as I can, but I'm not going to be ashamed if I have to stop and walk. And so, uh, I would start with like a minute of running and then I would walk for a couple of minutes until I felt like, um, my breathing was down and my heart rate was down. And then I'd run for another minute. Uh, sometimes that would take a couple of minutes um, for my heart rate to come back down. Sometimes it would take like five or six minutes. Um, so I would literally just run and walk until I slowly over time, that running time got up to five minutes and then it got up to a mile. And then I was able to run two miles and, you know, take a little bit of break in between uh, that. And then, you know, as, as my disease markers would calm down, as the medications would start to do their work and my body, I, I use the term like open a lot. Um, which I think is kind of very effective with vasculitis patients when you think about vasculitis being an inflammation disease and, you know, blood flow is certainly super critical to exercise. And so I, I talk about my body being open and when it's open again, those blood vessels are open. You can, your muscles and stuff can get the, uh, the blood flow that they need, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, and so until your body's kind of open again, exercise is going to be really, really tough. And, recognize that you have to go at your own pace. Um, don't get frustrated um, with your progress. It's going to take time. Um, I've actually had, in the process of helping coach two vasculitis patients right now um, that are, you know, have some fairly lofty goals. Um, and that's the big thing that we talk about with both of them is, is space. And they probably have about double the number of recovery days in between harder or longer efforts than uh, a regular person, a health, regular healthy person would have of their ages. Um, so it's, it's about creating space and allowing your body the time that it needs to recover. Uh, whether that's 
in the session that you're out there or whether that's the days in between you walking or exercising uh, and, and stressing your body. Uh, it's important to, to make sure that you are, that you are recovering. Your body's already at civil war and it's spending a lot of its resources to just stay alive and not, and not die. And when you stress it with exercise, it's a good thing and going to help with a lot of stuff, but you also have to recognize that you don't necessarily have all of the resources that a normal healthy person would have to, um, to recover from those bouts. So, um, be smart, uh, but also don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to go out there and exercise. In fact, I'll toss my last slide up, um, which, uh, oh man, that quote's not on there like it's supposed to be. Um, Oh, well, I covered it up with that logo, actually, now that I think about it. Um, but uh, I said this a few years ago at the last International, International Vasculitis Symposium and got lots of head nods from the doctors, which was, you're going to feel like junk a lot of the time uh, as a patient. And uh, if you're going to feel bad, regardless of whether you're laying in bed or whether you're exercising, you might as well get out and go do something that's good for your body. Yeah. And just to echo off that, that that's exactly what I did. I did the walk run technique, you know, before that I would just go out for simple walks. I'd go to, to the gym and do get on the treadmill. And then when I felt I was ready, okay, I'm going to go for a run. And I just simply ran up the block, came back, uh, walked back at, at the, to the end of the block and did that, you know, for, um, I don't know, a good couple of weeks. And then when I decided to go out for a full run. I just did a simple mile and I just did that for, you know, two, three weeks until I felt comfortable. And then I got to two miles and then eventually next thing I was running three miles and just left it there for a while till I felt comfortable. And then that three miles was basically like my marathon. Like I can run three miles. That was a huge win, but really the best advice is I can say is just be patient. I know it's really difficult and really hard. Um, but it'll, it, it will come around to you. You just got to be um, patient, go slow. And again, there, there is no right or wrong answer. Just go at your own pace and, and really listen, listen to your body. You know, there's another question. Um, someone asked about medications. Did you switch your, do you do your training days on days away from your main meds or how did you do that when you started out? I, when I first got diagnosed uh, with vasculitis, I uh, uh, was on 60 milligrams. Of course, I didn't uh, do, any, you know, I didn't get back to running until a good four or five months. Um, I, I was on 60 milligrams for a long time. And, you know, like Brandon alluded to, you know, it's not just bone density. Um, it's going to break down your, um, mu um, your muscle. And looking back at it now, I definitely think that was probably a struggle for me. I just now barely got off prednisone a week ago. Um, I've been on a really low dose, you know, less than 10 milligrams the last uh, two years. And I'm by no means saying my runs are easy, but I definitely noticed a difference, like not being on, on prednisone um, now, because it's like, wow, you know, my legs don't feel as tired like they did before. But again, you got to just be uh, patient. So um, I had to take prednisone every day, but um, I, looking back at it now, that that was probably a, a determining factor is like it just running was just so difficult for me. And again, I'm not saying that it's easy now, but looking back at it, you know, four years later, it's 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 definitely made a difference just to 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 be in that routine. And certainly, you know, as we, I get lower and lower on prednisone, I did notice a difference. Yes. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you to both of you. And I think one of the most important things you both said was celebrate the, sh the small victories. You know, so many times our patients have challenged because maybe they did used to run dead gaze, but celebrate whatever you can do and you can build upon that. So Brandon and Art, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Art, you can go back to bed, get some more sleep and then um, or maybe go for a run. But thank you both for joining us today. And, and Joyce, can I, I'll just say real quick too, if, if anybody, and I, I know you've passed plenty of people my way over the years, but um, if anybody's on this and has specific exercise questions, um, they can always reach out to me. I'll throw up in the chat my email. Um, I always make myself available to talk to vasculitis patients, um, you know, whether it's social media, um, emails, text, phone calls. Um, I'm always available to, to talk. Um, so please don't don't hesitate to to reach out and I'm happy to happy to help in any way that I can. 
And, and I can attest to that. You know, uh, when I first got diagnosed, um, I didn't know who Brandon was. I didn't know what his involvement was. Um, I didn't know too much about the victory over vasculitis and I was a little hesitant, but I, uh, thanks to the power of social media, I, I reached out to him and I thought, gee, he's probably going to wonder who's this guy, but he actually responded. And, and then that's how we came in contact. So, um, I can tell you firsthand, Brandon is very, very, uh, accessible and he's a great, great partner. Yeah. I, Yes, absolutely. So thank you again, both of you. Have a good afternoon. Oh my gosh, I don't think I've ever seen Dr. Merkel in a t-shirt. Not just any t-shirt. <laughs> yes. Great. Foundation t-shirt. Great. Okay. You know, if I'm going to come to the man cave, I should so, be I got a new Saturday morning. Got my <laughs> Um, that is so perfect. So I think we have a poll. Kaylin, we have a poll to uh, launch with the audience before Dr. Merkel starts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the question we wanted to ask is, what do you feel or think is the primary reason men do not participate in research? Uh-oh, they're not even going to answer this one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Okay, we're going to give it a few more seconds. Hopefully everybody will uh, register a response. The clock is ticking, as they say on Jeopardy. I'm not going to play the theme song because I don't want to have that song in my head. But just mentioning it, now it's in all of ours. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay. okay. I think we've had Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. well, we'll the answers yet, I think, right? We're going to wait. Right. So, okay. At this time, I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Peter Merkel. He is the chief of rheumatology and a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an internationally recognized research and clinical expert in vasculitis, a disease that he has studied for over 25 years. He's also an author of over 300 scientific publications and he is the principal investigator of the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, an NIH-sponsored um, initiative. He's also the principal investigator of our Vasculitis Patient-Powered Research Network and is one of our longtime VF medical consultants. Uh, we've worked with him for years. And uh, Dr. Merkel, thank you for joining us. Also joining us today uh, for this session is Paul Brown, who was diagnosed with GPA in 2009. And Paul's been a longtime volunteer with the VF. He is also a patient partner lead with the VPPRN. And we are hoping the two of you can discuss about why is research important for men? Why should they participate? And Paul, we'd love your feedback on why did you get involved? Because you've been involved for, from day one, raising awareness and also trying to help other patients um, with their diagnosis of vasculitis. And Paul also came in late last night from vacation. So, Paul, thank you for making time to be with us also today. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, Dr. Merkel, you have the floor. So, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So, Mr. Brown, good to see you. I'm going to first, I was asked to give a recap of the vasculitis patient powered research network. So hopefully everybody is aware of the VPPRN. This is the main research arm now of the Vasculitis Foundation. It is a partnership between the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, which is an international research network that I have left that we've been around for 20 years, and the Vasculitis Foundation. And our mission is an international research network of patients, scientists, clinicians, advocates, and family members works to improve healthcare and quality of life for patients with vasculitis through high-level clinical research. It's a research enterprise. We've been around since 2014, building stronger and stronger and larger and larger. We've had, we have close to 4,000 patient partners that have been involved in 17 different studies, including 18 different types of vasculitis. So your type of vasculitis is represented. We've published multiple scientific papers we have grants, we have uh, all sorts of things going on that have been successful in conducting research in this new and different way. We're part of a larger set of enterprises. Here's the VPPRN in the middle. 
what you see is we are a big partnership between the Vasco Foundation and to you, that's your Vasco Foundation, my Vasco Foundation, the Vasco Clinical Research Consortium, centers of excellence in Vasco working research together around the world. And we're part of something called the Autoimmune Research Collaborative, which are other patient online research enterprises for, relate, for diseases that relate to us because they also are autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, because they have some similar ideas and we've been able to do stuff together. And we have other collaborators, including industry partners and other stakeholders. And all of that comes together to do this research that we're doing. It's a patient powered research network. And by that we mean, and we're still continually refined what that means, patients are work for the development and management of the data collection, research agenda, and sharing of research findings. Our philosophy is simple. We conduct high quality patient, high quality research for patients with patients. Patients are involved in developing the research questions, writing the study summaries, thinking about the protocols. Patients are more than just data points. They give feedback, they're part of the planning. Not all patients, but the patients that are partnered for that particular project. And they bring their insights into how we do the research because from the patient standpoint, they could, they could tell us, you know, Dr. Murphy, that's never gonna fly. No one's gonna understand that or that's not how we would say it. That's not how we think about the problem. And that's very, very helpful. But let, and I'm, I'm saying that because we're interested in how to get more men involved in the VPPR in particular and in research in general. Researchers, researchers need men, why? What's the problem with men? Well, we could ask um, our partners and our friends, but I think we will uh, get lots of answers depending who you ask in your household, but let's narrow this down to in terms of participating in research. So in terms of participating in research, the problem is that men are highly underrepresented in all types of clinical research, observational studies, clinical trials, surveys, and especially online research. We see this over and over again. Men are less likely to join research. They're less involved in large studies or even small studies. The problem isn't having too many women. The problem is having too few men. We want as many patients participating in research as possible. We always want more women as well, but we have too few men relative to women and in general too few. Research should include a representative sample of, of people with a disease. So if 50% of patients with GPR are men, then 50% of the study patients with GPA should be men as well. Even if only 10% of patients with Takayasu arteritis, one of our vascular disease that we study, then at least 10% of the study patients should be men as well. And so you can see we have to have people represented. Why is that important? Well, men and women have some differences. Male sex may lead to different issues in a disease versus female sex physiologically. The manifestations, the signs, the symptoms, the laboratory findings may be different for some things for men and women, and maybe different during their lifetimes, different things at different ages. The responses to different medications can be different for men and women. The impact of the medication, different other medical problems. We don't have, but men don't have some of the time, obviously don't have any of the gynecologic issues, and women don't get prostate disease. And so there are differences that happen that, that are important. Men get heart disease you talked about. They get that earlier in life than women. So there are things that interact that we need to know about. And then of course, socially, there, you know, and, and in behavior, there is differences. There are differences between men and women. You need to be able to capture that. So if we're capturing the impact of a disease on your well-being, that may be different for men and women at different times. So we need everyone represented. And this is a problem in research in vasculitis, but it is not unique to vasculitis. It's a problem in cardiology and in arthritis and in neurology. It's a problem that's noted in this country and other places. So men just don't participate in research to the same extent. And that's especially true outside of the clinical trials where you study a new medication, but you survey online. The question, of course, is why? So let's hear from you. Um, why do you think men are less likely to join research studies? What strategies do you think the VP Vern could use to recruit and retain more patients than men? What are we not getting? Before we get to that, 
Um, before we get to the video, what if, maybe Mr. Brown, you'd like to make some comments and then we can get to our answers and make, get a discussion with our participants. What do you think? Okay. <clears throat> I guess before I talk about why I got involved with research, I'll give the Reader's Digest version of my story. Mine's crash and burn. My first symptom showed up around the 4th of July, and I was in induced coma and ICU by Labor Day. And it took me a year to learn how to walk again, learn how to swallow again, and to get back to just about normal, and probably another year to get back to where I was prior to getting the disease. And now I'm in remission. I'm not taking any medication for vasculitis. So I'm real interested in how I never have to take any more medication for vasculitis and stay in remission. So that's one of the reasons why I got, when I found out that I had a rare disease, then the question becomes, okay, if it's a rare disease, how can I help? Because there's not very many of us that have it. And so most everyone who has it should participate if they can, is the way I thought about it. And the range is of participate of opportunities to participate are from clinical studies to just filling out a survey on the internet. And the data that they get from the survey helps um, with diagnosis. It helps with how doctors understand how patients feel about certain things when they're going on their path to uh, recovery. I was involved with a thing that was an international study with some Brits, Canadians, um, that had to do with, and I don't think it's been published yet, but it had to do with um, plasma exchange. You'll be, see, you'll be seeing the manuscript soon. Oh, okay. And, and that was very interesting. And they were really interested in what patients thought. And because it's a plasma exchange is kind of a, um, I don't want to say dangerous, but it's there's aspects to it that are complicated and can lead to uh, adverse outcomes as well. And so they want to know how patients felt about that. So, you know, the main thing to me was, if not me, who? And if not now, when? Because if we're gonna, if we're going to have a victory over vasculitis, as Brandon says, then we've got to have people involved in research. That's the only way that we can find a cure to this disease. So I guess that's my little presentation. That's great. So Kaylin, maybe and and uh, Mr. Brown's been a great partner in the BPPRN and very important part of our development um, in that project uh, was it. That was an excellent project. So that is coming. Dr. Walsh promises me. Um, so, um, Joyce, can you show the answers to the poll? Oh, All right. So that's interesting, right? So, what is the primary reason? Now, we didn't say click all the ones that apply, but we could have. Not aware of research, don't have time, not interested concerned about personal health privacy, concerned about medical risk, um, other. So um, maybe we should address a few, but maybe we should hear from people, Mr. Brown, maybe we should open it up and let our participants. I just want to say one thing about the personal health data privacy. Um, I'd just like to be extremely reassuring that the computerized systems we have in place, the data, the VPPRN, very secure system. We've never had a data leak in the almost 20 years we've worked with the group that keeps the data. It is very secure. We, you do tell us, you know, the database and it's not released elsewhere unless you allow it. So there is, um, your medical information is very secure. Uh, it's not shared by name or any major identifier. I don't know if there's that. It's, I can be very, very confident in that. It's a very secure system. Um, Maybe we should open it up and let people talk about this. Uh, what do you think? We'd love our participants to give us some feedback. Uh, it would be even better if you showed your face, but you don't have to. Let's hear from folks. 
So you don't have time, you're not interested. Um, medical risk, um, obviously it depends on study. Studies with, right now, the, the VPPRN is not doing any interventional trials. It's all observational and we're, we're getting information from you. So there's no risk in terms of medication risk or procedures. But maybe we need to make that even clearer to people. And please, if you if you have a comment, if you hit the raise hand so that I know and I can unmute you and allow you to share your screen. Oh, I've been unmuted. William, mm -hmm. you have I've been asked my doctor about research opportunities, and nobody knows anything. I, I just I wouldn't even know where to go to look. I'm more than willing to do participate in any kind of research out there. This has turned my life upside down. I want to help other people avoid that. And I just don't know where to go. Can I ask you, sir, are you a member of the Vascotis Patient Guide Research Network? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> okay, no, that's that's fine. Are you on the Vascotis Foundation mailing list? I think so. Uh, I certainly got the email for this, but you know, where, wherever I need to go sign up, I'm more than willing to do so. It's just, I, I discovered this by accident trying to figure out how to run again. Okay. So, so uh, I don't know if Jamie or Joyce want to comment on people on our list. We certainly send notices out, but maybe we need to do it a different way. You want to comment, Joyce or Cameron or Paul? Yeah, so I think, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I do think that that we we communicate out a lot about the VPPRN and about uh, specific studies, but I think, you know, this is obviously an area where we need to improve and we need to have, uh, make that more obvious so that you know uh, that there are lots of research opportunities and we could always use more men. So, uh, but in the meantime, you can go to VPPRN Dot org, and you can enroll in the Vasculitis Patient Powered Research Network. And we'll certainly follow up with all the links to uh, research opportunities as well as the VPPRN uh, in the follow up email about this webinar. Yeah, I, I have a comment. I wonder how many physicians, just regular physicians, not researcher physicians, are aware of the VPPRN and even the Vasculitis Foundation? I think that that varies. The VP, it's very hard to recruit to the VPPRN through physicians. We know that they're busy. And the average rheumatologist and neurologist sees very few patients with vasculitis. They have one or two in their practice, maybe, maybe a couple more if they're busy practice. Um, well, I have you know, hundreds. And so we, we even concentrating on the big centers, they're not great at pushing patients towards these research things. For the trials, it's a little different, but you're right. To be honest, communicating about research opportunities when we open up new studies to other physicians is also a major challenge. We do mailings, we do this. It's, it's the same issue, catching their eyes, getting their attention. Um, often people will contact me and say, what research studies do you have going on right now? I may have a patient for you, that type of thing. So it's a similar issue. Um, six people had that answer. They were not aware, yet they were aware of this webinar, which I find is interesting. So they're obviously, they're obviously doing something to find that information. So what are we doing wrong? <clears throat> Can anybody uh, hear me right now? Yes, Daniel. Hi, nice to meet everybody. Um, <clears throat> I stumbled upon VP. PRN the other day, signed up, became a member. Um, I was just diagnosed with two forms of vasculitis, uh, roughly. The, fir the first one was about a week ago, leukocytoclastic vas vasculitis, and the uh, HSP just two days ago. Um, I found out uh, through the website just by doing some simple Google searches, and you guys popped right up on top. Um, so my wife and I are in agreement. We want to help out as two, you know, as well as two and do what we can. Uh, we live in the Adirondack Park and in New York State, so it's kind of difficult to travel <clears throat> all around. You know, just a good doctor's office is usually an hour and a half, two hours away. So some sometimes the research, and I understand, like with uh, I think the first person that spoke said, like the doctors are a little unsure of how to treat it. That's great. So you joined us. Thank you for joining the VP Grand. You sounds like you found it on your own. So our Google. Yes, I did. 
that, that's terrific. I, I'm gonna. I don't want to get too detailed. On, I hope you're going to continue to improve. I just want to clarify for you. I can't help myself. Leukocyte classic vasculitis isn't actually a type of vasculitis. That's a finding of the skin biopsy. Um, so you you really have, you probably have HSP, which is also known as IgA vasculitis, of which one of the problems is the skin vasculitis. So I would, okay, that's good to know. I would, don't, I don't, give think... you, don't give yourself two types of vasculitis. You have one, and you just have a bunch of things that happen to it. That's, okay, it is, that actually a sounds example up. of of how confusing medical terminology is. <laughs> but I can tell you, physicians got that problem too. So. Welcome to the VPPRN. I'm glad you were able to find it. Um, our, and we hope you continue to do uh, and improve. It's a, there's a good example of a disease that we need to do more research on. It's a tough fight. So I, you face you with the same problem with all right. this past week, and it's a challenge. So we need more research. Um, other people have mentioned. Um, Excuse me a second, Dr. Merkel. I, yeah. I have a comment. Because I, I have not gone to a center. I've worked with just regular physicians the whole time. So my advice is go on the Vasculitis Foundation website, get all the information you can get off that website, share that with your physician. You're going to have to help your physician understand how to treat your disease. So you almost have to become a partner with your physicians, or in my case, my herd of physicians, and you you really become the person who manages your own care. And to do that, you've got to have information, and the Vasculitis Foundation is the best place to get that information. And the VPPRN stuff is on top of that, and great, I hope you participate in that, but make sure that you're managing your own care. I agree, you need to be, well, Co-manager, let's say, would be a good advocate for yourself and uh, bring those list of questions um, to your appointments. Um, what else? It, some people wrote other. Um, what those two people? What are the other reasons that you would, that people may not participate? Can someone volunteer to speak to that? And then some people said they didn't have time, but they were on this seminar at webinar. So what? What's the amount of time? How do we make it? We've tried to make it a quicker participation. It probably takes 20 minutes now to participate in the VPPRN twice a year, unless there's a new study that we push out to you. Um, well, Paul Brown, do you want to talk about not having time? Yeah, most of the surveys that come out take about 10 or 15 minutes to, to fill out. They're not very long. It may get a little more detailed if you have some specific things that you that they ask for, but most of the time it's it doesn't take very long at all. And and most of the time there are results that get shared back, so you see kind of what's going on. But most of them aren't very time consuming. Now, if you're in a clinical trial, that's probably something else. But yeah. and clinical trials are very different. It's a good point clinical trial when you're getting a medication or something, that's visits to the medical center, lab test. That can also be less time than some people think. There are often more time up front in the first month as you get rolling and then it's less and usually coordinated with clinical visits. But there's definitely more time. It takes. That's why we, the VPPRN is a different thing. You do it on your own time, you do it at home. Um, you know, uh, no one knows you're, you're in your pajamas when you're filling out your forms and that's okay. Uh, one of the questions that came in through the chat box was, do you have to be active? Does the disease need to be active or do you need to be in remission or does it matter? That's a great question. For the VPPRN, it doesn't. First of all, we, of course, hope everyone's in remission, but we know that's just not the reality, right? People are active disease or they go in remission and they have a relapse or a flare, uh, however you want to call it. Um, for the VPPRN, we want people in any stage of their illness any level of activity, any age, because that's part of what we're trying to understand is the, is the full landscape of what's going on out there for patients. We call that real, you know, real world data. So when I run it, when, when, I, when I do a clinical trial and we have 300 patients, highly selected around the world, that's good, but that's not everybody. That's a particular group. This we're trying to get a more general group. So we want people who are 
in any stage of disease. And then we follow you over time, right? So if you're in remission and then you relapse, we don't like that, but we want to capture some information so maybe we can learn about health. Are there other comments, Joyce, in the chat? Um, Victor shared that he was happy he could participate in the VPPRN. Um, he's had a good experience. Um, uh, Daniel had a question if it's genetic. Um, I think that's more, if you want to address that. I'll address it very briefly because it's off topic, but it's always a good, great question. So vasculitis, genetics probably play a role in many diseases, not like hair color and eye color. We don't think there's one gene, although for Vexus there is, but for most types of, or data too, but for most types of vasculitis, we think there's a genetic component that puts people at greater risk of having vasculitis and probably different genes influence whether you get one part of your body affected or another. We're still trying to discover all that. So it's, it's a clue to what's going on, and there may be subsets genetically, but it's not so strong for that kind of problem that you need to necessarily worry about your children or your siblings per se. But we do a lot of genetics work to try to figure that out. Great. Okay, I think we've uh, covered all the questions that Great. were submitted. Oh. No, I just want to say thank you to the VF for letting us do this. We, we're interested to know how to get more participation. I don't know if Mr. Brown wants to make a closing comment. No, I'm, I would like to echo that. Thanks, Joyce, for inviting us to do this and hopefully it'll help with the outreach. Oh, thank you, Paul, for participating this morning. Dr. Merkel, thank you. We will be doing a follow-up survey with the attendees and we actually had 79 people register for the event. So we will be sending information out to them. We've recorded this uh, today and we'll be sharing that out. So we really do want to encourage more people to participate in the VPPRN. Um, so we will be doing more outreach. So, but thank you again, both of you for joining thank us you. today. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Um, our next session is, uh, we want to discuss the em emotional impact the vasculitis has on patients. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome two new presenters to the group. Uh, John Stadler is, um, a GPA patient. He lives in the Minneapolis area. He was diagnosed with GPA in 2017 and was in, uh, made it into remission the next year in 2018. It took him about a year, but John and I have become friends and colleagues and um, because he is a volunteer who uh, last year he contacted me, he said, Joyce, I think we need to have virtual support group meetings during COVID when nobody can meet. And so I was like, John, what would that look like? He's like, let's do it on Zoom. Let's do it on Wednesday afternoons. And we started with one. Um, and now we have three Wednesday afternoon Zoom support group meetings. And then John also hosts one in the evenings, uh, the second Tuesday of each month. He hosts a virtual Zoom meeting uh, for patients. And um, I just have to say thank you to John because he stepped up when we needed the help. And he's been amazing, just been an amazing leader. And uh, we, we just are so appreciative. Um, and so John will be sharing his story. Our other uh, presenter for this session is Dan Bleicher. And Dan lives in Arlington, Virginia. And he also uh, contacted me last year and said, hey, I want to start volunteering for the VF. He was diagnosed with eGPA vasculitis um, several years ago. Um, he has a wife and three kids. Uh, they're 16, 14, and 10. And uh, I know his Saturdays are probably very important to him and his family. So, Dan, thank you for joining us also today. Um, so Dan was diagnosed with eGPA in 2019. He had a career in the Navy. He was in the Navy for 14 years um, where he's a pilot, a mission commander, and then an admiral's aide, which I have no idea what that is, but um, probably something very stressful. Um, and now Dan uh, works for Inside Consulting, a firm that works to make mid-sized companies more profitable. Um, but most importantly, he wrote, he is the defensive coordinator for his son's flag football team that has gone to the league championship for two years in a row now. So I'd just like to welcome both John and Dan to your session. And thank you for letting me flip the sessions with Dr. Merkel. 
because of his schedule. So you guys have the floor and I'll leave it up to you, okay? And how about if you go first? Sure, sure. So thanks for that warm introduction. Um, my name is Dan Bleicher. I was diagnosed with EGPA about two years ago, almost to the day. Um, so prior to my diagnosis, I've been incredibly healthy and fortunate in life. Um, never had anything go wrong, so to speak. And then all of a sudden, um, one symptom after another started developing in the spring of 2019, which led me to, to be admitted to the hospital for just about a full month. Um, afterwards, I was on every medication you could imagine and also going through cytoxin treatments. Um, I say all that because beyond having, as we all do, stressful jobs and a lot going on at home, I also had three kids who um, have varying degrees of understanding of what EGPA or vasculitis or even being sick was all about. So their perspective um, has really helped shape my the, the way I've addressed all things vasculitis and how I've had to, I would say, morph and, and reprioritize the time of the day uh, around how I set priorities, what I say no to now, and what I, again, prioritize to make sure that I'm the right, the best father I can be while also not letting my professional career fall off too much and while also making sure that I'm taking care of myself from a physical fitness standpoint, whether that's small things or, or, or big things. And um, just to give you one kind of example, I know uh, I, I heard Art and I heard Brandon talk a little bit about the running. For me, just making it down a block or two shortly after being diagnosed was, was huge. And what I started to do was doing short walks to the local Starbucks with my daughter and, uh, Luckily, she's 10 at the time, and she's a talker, so she would talk for an hour straight, and lo and behold, it would take us an hour sometimes to walk a block or two, and that that went over her head, this notion that why is it taking us an hour to walk a block? It was just because I was still out of breath the whole way, but it's just a matter of fitting things in like that, whereas two years ago, I would be able to run that block in no time at all, whereas now that was something that I would have to really think through and grind through even with my daughter there. So it's something that I have really had to think, think about in terms of prioritizing, um, saying no to things I've done in the past or doing things at a much slower pace in life than I have in the past, all because of vasculitis. John, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you um, to talk a little bit about your background too. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Stout. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And as Joyce mentioned, um, I contracted vasculitis in February of 2017 and went through quite a journey, as I'm sure many have, as a male and as a husband. It was very challenging uh, to find support and to find camaraderie. Uh, my cohort of, of gentlemen that I knew really didn't understand or didn't have a the empathy and compassion. So it was a lonely journey, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. And I discovered through the process that uh, there, there were a number of things that I was reliant on, obviously doctors and medication and the approach to treating it. And as Joyce had mentioned, I was very fortunate uh, in October of 2018 to be declared, relatively speaking, in chemical remission, meaning I still take rituximab every six months, but the disease is dormant. In that process, I found out that there were many things I had to give up, the physical things. I had to retire early. Uh, I developed cognitive issues, some factors which really influenced my ability to work. And as you know, in many cases with men, work is an identity, and uh, I had to give up on that and essentially retire early. Um, but I found out that in this whole process, there were gifts that were associated with the losses. And some of those gifts, which were very important to me, certainly one the gifts of faith, um, friends who actually understood and were compassionate and understanding and highly supportive, and my relationship with the Vasquez Foundation, as, as uh, Joyce mentioned, volunteering, and from my point of view, is a very healthy 
and gives you the ability to, to have a purpose and a focus, which is very important. And so as, as uh, Joyce mentioned, we started a support group and we, we have roughly uh, 30 people a week and, uh, and more. So it's been a, an interesting journey uh, at times, ups and downs that uh, Brandon had talked about in terms of mentally, and uh, you know, as Dan said as well, the physical. Um, the reality is, I'm just not the same person I was before. But I have many opportunities yet ahead of me, and and, and the enthusiasm to uh, proceed with those. I think Joyce, you had a poll that uh, for the group. Sorry. Um, yeah. So Kaylin left, I believe. So let me see if the poll got loaded real quick. Okay. Sorry about this. Um, John, do you remember which one it was? I think um, my phone is beeping. Oh, I think John, you had asked about um, the, you had asked about vasculitis impacting your social life and um and also about the physical activities that Brandon and Art talked about. And then also if, if people have had to give up their careers, if that's something people in the audience have had to rethink their careers, uh, restructuring. And we can absolutely open it up if anybody wants to comment on this. Um, we don't have it set up as a poll, I don't think. But if anybody would like to raise their hand, we'd be happy to unmute you for comments. And Dan, maybe with you and your career, did you have to rethink with your energy level plus the three kids and everything plus coming out of the Navy? Sure. So um, fortunately, my job was is remote and was remote prior to COVID. So um, with vasculitis, to be honest with you, there are times of the day where I just lose all energy for some reason. It's something that prior to having vasculitis, I would have. I would have been pretty upset with myself and I would have pushed through. Whereas now I know I can't always push through and that's not always the right answer. So there are times in the day where I have to prioritize myself. And if that means uh, resting for an hour at two o'clock on a Tuesday, well, so be it. And, and I'll do that. And knowing that when I'm refreshed and recharged, I will go back and be a, a better, I would say, employee or more productive worker. And if I need to work later into the afternoon or evening because of that, that's fine. If that means that I've got to say no to the kids for some period of time, um, again, knowing that I need to recharge or take care of myself first so that I can be a better father to them, then again, so be it. And, and that, that's best. My, my big takeaway from this over the past couple of years and dealing with it is that you can take care of yourself first. You can prioritize yourself first and say no to others. And people understand uh, whether it's whether it's my kids, whether it's my my manager, um, um, the people who I'm working for. Um, so sometimes by taking care of yourself in the short term, you're really heading off bigger problems um, in the course of the week or course of the month. So again, I feel a lot more comfortable these days saying no and not feeling like that's a a move out of weakness per se, and that that's a, just a a way of managing this, this, this disease that we have. Yeah, I think we've had a lot of, especially our male patients who've had to step away from their career tra trajectory. I know, John, you had to um, shut down your company after your illness. Did you think about trying to keep it going part-time or was that just even too much also? That's a great question, Joyce. And the, and the answer is yes, I did try to uh, keep going. And actually, probably for a good six months, I was able to do it and do it in a part time fashion. Uh, but it got to be too difficult. And uh, I had to, it's kind of like what Dan talked about, prioritize. And uh, the priority for me was my health. I wasn't willing to sacrifice my health for, for employment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those were tough and difficult decisions. But it was one that, that I felt I had to make. And, you know, as the key breadwinner, it was, it was certainly a difficult transition. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So your wives, where were, were they involved in your decision? I mean, I'm sure both of you being ill, um, your wives stepped up probably to help take care of things. You know, was that new for you? Because we often hear from the wives who, um, well, we actually hear from the husbands who say, I've always opened the car door for my wife. I'm the driver in the family. Um, did you guys have to deal with that? Even little things like that, that we, you know, it's, it's interesting that people will tell me, well, I can't drive right now. Mm -hmm. In my situation, because I was no longer able to bring in the income, my wife uh, retained her job and worked an extra three years. So it was a sacrifice on her part when she had anticipated retiring at that time. Mm -hmm. And Dan, how about your wife, if you don't mind sharing? Sure. There's, there's definitely times, small things and large things alike with that. I, I, again, I, I either can't do as well as I used to or can't do as intensely as I used to. And it's just a matter of asking for help or realizing that we need to Instead of going 110% of the family, we need to scale back a little bit. Maybe just go 90% this weekend. Maybe we don't uh, do that extra thing on a Saturday afternoon that we come back to the house and, and relax the family. Um, so it's just a matter of together with, with my partner, with my, with my wife, um, working things out and making sure that I'm being, I guess, articulate and clear about when I'm hitting my limit because um, when I do hit my limit, I get very tired and, and sometimes even can have, let's say, a bad attitude, which I'm sure some of us can relate to. And I, I think it's better just to over communicate. So, um, so she's aware of, of what's going on um, at, at a given moment and then on, over the course of a week as well. So what about that? But you look well. I mean, do you have that discussion with your friends who... Um are surprised that you can't go out and golf 19 or 18 how many ever holes of golf um uh you know do you have friends who forget that you might have uh challenges because you look good you know i i can't tell I, you how many times we hear that i definitely do um so i'm a i'm a relatively private person there's plenty of, plenty of my friends either i never told them about this or friends who i told them and you know, I don't like to bring it up. I don't like to make it a, a main topic of, of our conversations. So I think they forget about it over time. Um, however, I, I do bring up or find excuses, we'll say, to kind of get out of things or not be able to not engage as much as I have in the past. Um, it could even be a night going out, going out drinking or something like that, where maybe in the past we could have all done that, but now with all the medications is clearly not a wise move to make. Um, so I, I think I'm a little bit more maybe creative about some excuses. Again, I'm, I'm a bit of a private person, so um, I, I try not to bring it up too much with, with all of my friends other than my perhaps my closest network. How about you, John? You know, I can identify with Dan. Um, you know, I, I at first tried to express what I was dealing with to, to get certainly some support. And of course, I had no one I could talk to that had the disease. Most didn't understand it. And so I finally summarized it in the context that the, my immune system is attacking my body. And that was kind of an aha moment for some people. Um, you know, the other thing is that uh, it's just not in, in the... Uh, the normal approach in dealing with, with men in general uh, to, to really discuss a lot about health conditions and stuff. And so it was a bit of a, bit of a challenge to be able to get that support and, and, and understanding. And over time, uh, I found friends who did, but it was, uh, it was not the same number of friends that I had originally. Um. One of our uh, attendees, Steve, wrote, I was a paramedic firefighter for about 23 years, part of my MPA diagnosis just over a year ago. I was off work for six months and on light duty for six months and thought my career was coming to an end when I was fortunate to have the opportunity to begin a new program and new in a new role with my department. And so um, any thought comments about that? I, I personally think that's wonderful. I mean, I yeah. think that any any company entity which will give you that type of flexibility and understanding of your situation 
is phenomenal. I mean, that that's uh, showing empathy and support and care for an individual dealing, as, as we've said earlier, with an extremely rare disease. You know, and I think that's a, you know, that's a topic for the future that we could have is like, how do you have those discussions with your boss or with the HR department? Um, John, I know you ran your own company. Um, Dan, I, you know, how do we, how do you start that conversation? And when do you know when to have it? Is it apparent or do you think it's something you learn after your diagnosis and under treatment? For me, it was pretty straightforward. Um, so I was, I was in the hospital. I, I, didn't tell, I did not tell anybody at work about my, uh, my symptoms, some of which were quite severe prior to going to the hospital. Um, and so my boss was calling me and texting me and sending me work. And then finally, my wife sent, sent him a picture of me um, with an oxygen mask on and IVs in and one eye open and one eye closed. So that's when he realized how serious it was. But what I would say is only by being, again, very clear with, with, my, with my manager and my, my, my bosses about what I can and can't do and how we can perhaps meet in the middle for certain things. For instance, like I was saying before, if on a Wednesday I'm exhausted and I really can't get at it, they would prefer me not to work and, and um, be um, non-productive, but get so billing the client for me to perhaps be making mistakes because I'm tired. They'd rather me push that work to another day or um, whether it's be working more hours in a day or maybe working a little bit on the Saturday morning another time that week. So I think it's just being a little bit clear about what I can and can't do. And they are, are, they were more than willing to work with me. And even now they periodically ask like, okay, how are you doing health wise? So that they don't overload me because from their standpoint, Hey, of course they want me to, to be well, but on the other side, they also know that um, from the business side of things, having me as an engaged employee and productive is, is beneficial for the company itself. Yeah, I think that's great. John, how about you? Well, we had a, I had actually was forwarded a couple of questions and, um, you know, from my standpoint, at least I can address the question, uh, owning my own company, I was receptive to any employee's needs specific to health or, you know, family or whatever. I think that uh, it's more common today for organizations to be more understanding. Um, the era of COVID has certainly brought forward the, uh, uh, the dialogue and interaction between employees and their companies. I think that the early, early on diagnosis and uh, treatment is important. And, and what happens is that, and it didn't happen for me because I own my own business, but it would have been very apparent with the number of doctor visits and hospitalizations, there would have been a clear signal that there was something, uh, uh, you know, seriously going on. And we would have probably had that discussion. Mm -hmm. I think one question and one was about uh, from an individual uh, who is, feels wiped out during the uh, Saturdays and, and certainly having uh, difficulty with activity and feeling uh, uncomfortable with that. And I think that one of the things that I've learned from others, not from myself, is that listen to your body and, and for those around you to be able to understand that, as Dan said, you know, there are limitations to what you can do any given day and, and maybe anticipate what you can do that day and work with others. There was one other question that uh, a person said that they had missed two golf outings and, um, you know, the re his relationship with his friends associated with the illness. And it, what I have found is that being upfront and honest, today I'm capable of, and tomorrow I'm not capable of, and here's why, are, are very good ways to express the situation. If others have more interest, they may ask. If they don't, at least they understand that it's, it's not a motivational or relationship issue, but a medical issue. Yeah, I think those are such good, you know, it's a medical condition. It's, you know, help your friends and family understand what it is, what you're going through. Um, I, you know, I just, um, Dan, any final comments from you? Um, no, I, I think this, 
this entire panel and session today has been phenomenal. Um, it's just really great. I think us as, as guys, um, sickness, uh, fatigue, those are all perceived perhaps as weaknesses and things that we need to gut through and society you know, looks down upon that, especially some of our backgrounds, um, whether it's EMS, uh, the fire department was saying, um, Olympic level running. So as soon as you start backing away from going 120%, you start perceiving that internally as weakness and it's somewhat frowned upon. So I, I would say that hearing everybody else talk that we've, we've all gone through the same stuff. It is not weakness. It is just this disease. And so try to turn that negative uh, resentment, the frustration into some level of positivity and challenge, channeling it towards, um, towards, towards goodness, prioritizing towards your family, to the people who matter most to you and to the things that matter most to you and, and listening to your body. Because at some point you, you, you might need to take that break in the middle of the day. You might not be able to walk more than that one or one or two blocks, but my sense is that if you keep at it, hopefully you know, you can walk that one block to turn into two blocks and three and um, just know that there's a full support network of people, at least while I look around the, the audience and know that there are people much stronger than me who, who, have, who have struggled and have overcome quite a bit. So there's no reason why I feel like all of us together as a group can't do the same. John, how about you? I'll give you the final word. Well, I would like to thank the Vasquez Foundation for the, the opportunity to share and hopefully my uh, story and, and the things that I've discussed have at least helped one person. And as Joyce mentioned earlier, um, we do have a support group from the Vasquez Foundation that I facilitate. It's on the website under events. Uh, should anyone um, in, desire to join, uh, we do have men that do join, and uh, we certainly encourage that and uh, would welcome that. But thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here today. Great. And I just want to thank all of the speakers. All of you did an amazing job. As I mentioned earlier, this was our first conference for men, and uh, I think it was a huge success. You guys have amazing knowledge and experience. Thank you so much for uh, being open to to sharing your information, sharing your experiences. Um, there will be a post-event survey that goes out. We have recorded this session, so we will be posting it out on the website after Ed does his magic uh, post-production work. Um, I would want to thank our sponsors again, Amgen, Genentech, GSK, and Sanguine. They sponsored our 2021 virtual conferences, uh, and I we just want to say thank you to them. Um, I want to thank Kaylin and Ed for uh, being here on Saturday to help with this. Um, they're moving around in the background, so thank you so much. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of the attendees for participating today. Thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to spend time with us. Thank you for all your questions, your comments in the chat window. And I just want to wish everyone an excellent day. Have a great weekend.